Welcome to season four of the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom, where we discuss business agility through customer experience, employee experience, and digital transformation. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. The Agile World Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed on this show, you can go to my website at gregkillstrom.com and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, Meaningful Measurement of the Customer Experience, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the host of the Agile Brand Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the power of citizen data scientists and making data science and machine learning more accessible to non-technical users with the goal of increasing the ability for greater collaboration. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Tim Kraska, a professor at MIT and co-founder at Einblick. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Yeah, looking forward to talking about this with you. Um, so why don't we start by you giving a little background on yourself and what you're currently doing at Einblick. Sure. Um, so I'm a professor at MIT and normally work in the intersection of like machine learning and systems. So over the last couple of years, I either built systems to make machine learning and data science in general more accessible, or more recently, I'm looking into how to leverage machine learning to improve the performance of systems. The company Einblick is actually based on a research project called Northstar, which started like over seven years ago at Brown University. And then at some point I moved to MIT with the goal to make data science much more accessible to a broader range of users and also more interactive and collaborative. Great. Well, let's uh, let's dive in here. So we're going to start by talking about data science um, as, a, as a practice. So, you know, in the scheme of things, Data science is relatively new, um, although, you know, depending on who you ask, it's been traced back to at least the 60s or 70s. But throughout its history and, and until now, it's mostly been relegated to those that have a deep understanding of either statistics or other highly technical fields. How does your approach at your company, Einblick, d- uh, differ from this? And what does a more collaborative approach to data allow teams to do? Yeah, like, so there are two trends we, we noticed. On one hand, it's like many companies are trying to become more data driven. So instead of like making decisions just based on gut feelings, they want to really tie them into the data and actual facts they are seeing. Plus, like, there is this whole movement towards like building models for different things. Like, you, you can simply do more in a shorter amount of time and be more productive and optimize decision making or or your processes in, in very sophisticated ways. So there's a strong trend towards people want to take advantage of all the data they have, but not everybody, of course, is a statistician and or has a math or a computer science background. Um, and so there are even these like estimates that like 70% of the workforce is like, uh, technically inclined and would like to do more, but not everybody can immediately. And we want to enable them that they actually can take advantage of the data so really drive like data-driven decisions. On the other flip side is whatever problem you're trying to solve or decision you're trying to make, you're never alone. Right? There are always like several stakeholders involved from managers who want to understand why you're recommending something to like uh, the domain experts who really understand the, the data but doesn't necessarily have the tools again to solve a problem. And then also like the, the data scientists or or more methy inclined people on the project team who really understand the technical details, but maybe don't have the background in, in like really the problem itself, like and understand the, the domain that well. And the question becomes how you can bring those different stakeholders together as a team to solve something together, rather than like they all wander off in different directions on their own, and then you need to coordinate everybody. Yeah. And so we really developed the Einblick platform to solve those two cases. On one hand, creating a platform which makes it easier for people to do data science if you don't have like a strong coding background. And on the other hand, how do you bring people together with different uh, skill sets into, into one room, either virtual or even in person, so that they can solve a problem? Yeah. And so in addition to the, the collaborative benefits, which, which you just mentioned, what what does this approach also mean for organizations that need to just be more nimble and adaptive and and quick in their decisions, quick but informed, I'll say, in their decisions? Yeah, like I, I think this this 
plays directly into it. Traditionally, like if you wanted to build like a predictive model, this used to be a months long process, right? Like first you, you say like, oh, I, I have a hunch that this might be useful in this context. Then somebody wanders off, tries something out, probably in Python, comes back two weeks later, says like, oh yeah, I built like this first model here. I got this data. And then the somebody on uh, in the domain field just says like, oh no, you actually did that the wrong way. And here the code changed from like 2010 to 2020. So you cannot use this data in that way anymore. You need to make this transform first. And then they wander off again for another two weeks and come back with something. And, you know, this process continues and continues over weeks and weeks. What we really wanted to, to enable is that everybody can come together in a room and solve something on the fly, for example, using one of these like interactive touch boards like the Microsoft Surface Hub and do something like as a team in real time together and not only just discuss what should be done, but maybe already start doing it and immediately discover if something doesn't work or, or does work. And so it's like shorten the time tremendously. And now because of the pandemic, we added a lot of like remote collaboration features as well. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the, the remote component? Because that, that does seem particularly relevant. Yeah. Like to, when we started the Nostar project, when it was still a research project, our original, um, uh, vision or motivation was to create a platform which particular runs on this like large interactive whiteboards like the Microsoft Surface Hub, Google Jamboard, uh, Samsung Flip. So essentially it's like a large TV you put on a wall, it, it's touch enabled and people were using it in the past mainly for having a shared whiteboard for video conferencing across different locations. And then we saw these like devices appear on the market. We, we thought there could be so much more. So why not create like uh, an environment for like creating a data room, like where people can work together on a problem in the same location and see results unfold immediately, try different types of models out, different features, immediately get the feedback, refine until they get an initial solution. So in the beginning, we were very focused on like in-person collaboration. And then of course, with the pandemic, everything changed and we added a lot of functionality so that people in different locations can now work together and i think this is a general trend in the industry so like if you think about like how you would do uh like text editing it used to be the case that you send word documents over email around right but nowadays everybody is on either microsoft uh, office 365 or, or google docs right. where you have a shared document that every everybody edits it in real time like in in one place right there's no like offline sending around and coordination required anymore it's like real-time done in one place. And you see the same trend happening in other areas. Like, uh, for example, uh, for design, it used to be the case that you send PDF documents around with your design right. proposals. And now people use Figma. Right? And again, same, same thing, real-time editing enables a whole different type of collaboration, particularly in remote locations. For data science, nothing like that so far existed. And we are filling this gap, particularly for low code environments like where people want to quickly explore something and create different visualizations build models in a completely uh like low code way yeah yeah and to to make it practical for the for the audience here do you mind giving an example you don't have to name company names or anything like that but you know could you give an example of a project that that a, maybe a customer worked on uh, just to give people a better sense of of what's possible of course. Um, so, for example, we are working with a large car manufacturer together. And um, he had like a whole range of different use cases. One is to figure out if a car, as it goes through the manufacturing pipeline, will be delivered on time or not. So like a car has like a unique identifier and then it goes through like different steps in the process. For example, mirror, uh, mirrors get uh, attached. Uh, the tires are like aligned, like a uh, paint job is done. And then maybe something also might happen, like a scratch happens. Oh, it has to go back into painting, right? Um, and so as you walk through these like different steps, you want to figure out like what's the likelihood at each step that the car actually still is uh, delivered on time. So it requires to do like a few operations on one hand, take this process data or this event data of like car went through milestone one, just got the painting done. Uh, and convert it into a form that you can actually build a model on top of it. 
And then you, you use that model to make a prediction as part of a dashboard, for example, for every car as it goes through on, on how likely this is actually uh, will out, be out in time. The other thing, in the moment you have the model, you can also start playing around with parameters. For example, you can do like things like, if I would increase the staffing number in the painting stash, station, so I have more people available, what impact might this have on my overall um, like ETA for the different cars on, on the production time? Right? Yeah. And so this is like one of the use cases. And what makes this so unique is like that the person who wanted to have it was actually a manager, meaning he's like responsible for the whole production line, but like he doesn't necessarily have a data science or statistics background, right? But he is the one who has the problem. Was then working together with data scientists. Their first step is just like looking at the data, trying to understand it, get a joint understanding what the different fields mean. And this requires a co close collaboration of the person who understands the data and all the milestones and what they imply, and the person who has a better understanding about the actual data science techniques, right? And they first need to agree on, because just taking the data as it is, like it's, it will just create results which are meaningless. Yeah, yeah, I, I love the way you you talk about that piece of it, because I mean, you know, in, in my experience as well, I, I would imagine in an organization like the one you mentioned, and certainly in my experience, you know, getting sending a request for data to the data team, and you know, most often it, I'm sure it comes back correct, but there's questions and there's a lot of things that maybe the the business owner doesn't necessarily understand on it, and so there's a there's a trans translation element there, and there's all sorts of things that are traditionally handled over sending documents over email, maybe a quick meeting here or there versus that that kind of hands-on collaboration that I think it, it so from what you're saying, at least, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it really helps everybody play to their strengths, right? Correct, correct. It's just like it gets everybody together. Everybody can really play to their strengths, as you said. And like the process is just shortened from like that trying an, uh, or wanting to try an idea out to getting a result, right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, let's, um, you know, extrapolating out a, a few years, let's, you know, talk about the future of the workforce. And you've already talked about how, you know, your product uh, itself has evolved to be more remote collaborative and everything like that. What do you see as some of the areas and as some of the possibilities for citizen data scientists out there and, you know, in, to really change the way that work is done and really change the impact within organizations? I think like a general trend is towards that everybody needs like a certain daily savviness uh, and should be able to work with data. So if, like I'm, I'm taking UC Berkeley here as an example because they started to introduce a, a data class for essentially everyone. Right? Not just like computer science majors or, or like if you're in math or in any of the sciences, but like really everyone. And I think that's a trend which is, which is really true. So even if you do literature nowadays, there exists a whole range of like really quantitative research work in that area, which is interesting. For example, there was this person analyzing the expressions of emotions over the centuries. Yeah. Right? And they used like very simple statistical techniques to determine what is the, the the amount of usage of certain types of words over the centuries and how do wars impact it, right? And does it have an impact on like what types of, of like literature is written? And I think this just demonstrates that there's like essentially no area left which is not impacted by data. But again, not everybody should be a, a data scientist or a statistician, but should be able to work with that if needed. And so there's a, not only a strong need for like, new types of tools, particular low-code tools, but also it will impact like any area I can think of. It's like hard to find anything which is not impacted by it anymore. Yeah, yeah. And so to follow up to that, then how how do you recommend that someone does get started that, you know, again, not necessarily one wanting to be a full-time statistician or data scientist or anything like that, but where should they get started with, you know, just having a, an understanding? And I completely agree with you, by the way, that I think um, I think there's a few things that everyone needs to ha at least have a base level understanding of. Yeah. Data is one of them. I, I would say visualization is a, is another yeah. one. Whether yeah. or not you're a designer, same thing. I think you need to be able to illustrate concepts. But to, you know, to talk about data scientists, I think everybody everybody needs to at least have a base understanding. But you know, where where might someone start with that? 
So if somebody wants to start now, I think like there are tons of like really good free courses available right now. Um, we are actually just designing a new one by ourselves. So like many of the existing one, we found that they're actually more focused on um, teaching you also to code. So not just the concept, but they also go way too quickly into like how you use Python. So like it's not just that you need to learn the concepts of what what like certain types of classifiers mean, but like at the same time they're also teaching you like the programming part of it. And I don't think that the second part is really necessary in many situations. Yeah. So like um, we are now designing actually even a new course which will be free, which is particular designed for people who want to work with data from time to time, get an understanding what like regression classification uh, means, what it means to take like event data and how you can transpose it to something that you can actually build a model all, over it and so on, uh, without requiring that they also become an expert in Python coding or R. Yeah. But, but there are already other courses out there. So like it's, it's, there's certainly not a shortage on like data science courses for beginners, right, on the web. Great, great. Well, um, I guess w one more question about your platform and, and your company. What's what's next on the horizon for you? Where do you see opportunity with with growing your platform? Yeah, like so. One thing we are particularly doing right now is like, um, like so we just moved from like on premise deployments, which like were mainly designed for large enterprises. So we, we in the beginning we focused on that. Currently, we just rolled out our SaaS offering. So if you go to einblick.ai, you can just go to the platform, just sign up and immediately use it for free and just play around with it. And you get like the full functionality already. And this is like probably the, the, like, the thing which we see many other data science platforms also doing. But like we, we are also definitely on that uh, train right now. It's just like having a very easy way that you can just log in play around with self on board. And we will expand that in, in certain ways so that we can actually even train you while you are doing the platform in more advanced concepts, as well as like in automations to prevent you from common mistakes. So we are really focused on this, like um, th these people who are like domain experts, but don't necessarily uh, want to learn how to code Python or an expert in Python, but like maybe sometimes works with data scientists together. So we don't exclude them in the sense of like that. If you are a data scientist, you want to code something, you can totally code on our platform. But the like the really strengths we have is that you bring domain experts and data scientists together to to achieve something great. That's great. That's great. Well, Tim, thank you so much for joining. Uh, for those listening, what's the best way for them to keep up with what you're doing and what your company's doing? Uh, just go to our website again, I'm like .ai, and yeah, sign up, try it out, and you we will always send you also happily a newsletter if you're interested. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, again, I'd like to thank Tim Kraska, professor at MIT and co-founder at Einblick, for joining the show. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom. Talk with you next week. Thanks again for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast, brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.theagilebrand.show. To get a copy of my latest book, Meaningful Measurement of the Customer Experience, visit my website at gregkillstrom.com. Until next week, stay agile.